Welcome scholars. My name is Squire Curtis and today we're going to be talking about the Declaration of Independence and the role that some Maryland patriots played in creating and bringing about that history changing document. Before we dive into that, let's do a little bit of background information so we understand the context of how that Declaration of Independence even came into being. So we're going to go back in time first to the French and Indian War. You may recall from your history classes that the French and Indian War was fought by the American colonists along with the British against the French and their allies, the Native Americans. By the time that that war ended in 1763 with the British and the colonists prevailing, uh, the British had incurred some big problems. First, they had incurred a lot of debt to pay for that war. Their other problem, which is actually a pretty good problem, is they now had much more territory that they needed to protect. That debt and the extra territory created a financial burden on the British, requiring the British to impose some taxes. So guess what they did? They started imposing taxes on the colonists. And as you can imagine, the colonists were not too happy about those taxes. Those taxes included the Sugar Act of 1764, the Stamp Act of 1765, the Townsend Act of 1767, which imposed taxes on all kinds of things such as glass and lead and paint, and then the Tea Act of 1773, and finally the Acts of 1774, which actually there were four of them, and combined they were called the Intolerable Acts, which did all kinds of terrible things, including requiring the colonists to quarter or basically house the British soldiers who were stationed over here in our colonies at that time. So those taxes and the actions by the British caused the colonists to protest and eventually revolt. So let's go back a little bit and talk first about the Sons of Liberty. Groups of American colonists began to secretly meet and discuss ways to get the British to stop these taxes and other actions. The groups began calling themselves the Sons of Liberty. In Maryland, the Sons of Liberty were founded by two Maryland patriots, Samuel Chase and William Paca. We're going to talk about more, uh, we'll talk more about them in a moment. Their meetings in Annapolis were literally held underneath a tree called a Liberty Tree on what is now the campus of St. John's College here in Annapolis. Unfortunately, that tree has since blown down and went down in a hurricane in the late 1990s. But you'll be happy to know that if you come to Annapolis, you can actually see uh, an offspring, if you will, of that tree, which has been planted and is again growing on the campus of St. John's College. So in addition to these um, Sons of Liberty groups, we started also having tea parties, basically protests against what the British were doing with respect to tea. So to protest the Tea Act of 1773, a local group of colonists boycotted tea and started to take swift action against anybody who they saw importing tea into the colonies. Well, the first and probably most famous act that they took or tea party that would happen was in Boston in December of 1773 when a group of Boston colonists uh, attacked, if you will, a ship that had been uh, in, in its harbor and which had imported some tea. So how did they attack it? Well, they dressed like Native Americans, snuck onto that ship in the dead of night, unloaded the tea from that ship, if you will, but what they did is they unloaded it into the Boston Harbor, ruining that tea. Well, not to be outdone, eight other colonies, including Maryland, also had their own tea parties. Uh, the Tea Party in Maryland, we call it the Annapolis Tea Party, occurred about 10 months after the Boston Tea Party. And this Maryland or Annapolis Tea Party occurred on October 19, 1774, when a local Annapolis merchant named Anthony Stewart was forced to run his ship, the Peggy Stewart, aground on what's now the United States Naval Academy and then burn his ship with all the goods in it, including that tea. Uh, now the colonists were getting even more agitated about what the British were doing and started to form their own colonial government. So in 17, 1774, after that Boston Tea Party, the colonists in Maryland and elsewhere began setting up their own government. Remember at the time, many of the colonies, including Maryland, um, had governors appointed by the British. 
uh, which were the officials who were in power. While in some cases these conventional governments seemed to reduce political tension, that certainly wasn't the case in Boston. After the Boston Tea Party, the British government shut down the port of Boston and sent more British troops to enforce the shutdown. In 1775, battles between the colonists and the British began in Massachusetts. We have, in April 1775, the battles of Lexington and Concord, and in June 1775, the Battle of Bunker Hill. Now, as a result, um, the colonies appointed George Washington as the commander-in-chief of a new American army to take on the British. As I noted earlier, those actions by the colonists were not successful. And instead, the British increased uh, their pressure on the colonists and sent more troops. The colonists met again in Philadelphia. It's called the Second Continental Congress. Uh, this time in May of 1775 to again see if they could get the British to deal more fair, fairly with the colonies. Once again, the colonists petitioned the King of England and that petition was once again rejected. Oh boy. This continued rejection of colonists' grievances and their petitions to the King um, led to the publication in January of 1776 of Thomas Paine's famous pamphlet called Common Sense. Uh, which began turning the American colonists to thinking about there's no other way but independence from the British, which was uh, up until this point a pretty radical idea, but now becoming a little bit more commonly understood as the only way that we could get out of this mess. So the Second Continental Congress continued to meet in Philadelphia during the spring and early summer of 1776. However, the delegates began looking into the possibility of declaring independence, and in May of 1776, Virginia's delegation proposed something called the Lee Resolution, which sought to declare independence from Britain. Many of the colonies, including Maryland, weren't really initially supportive of independence. But back in Maryland, Marylanders who did support independence, such as our friend Samuel Chase, and another gentleman by the name of Charles Carroll of Carrollton continued to rally support in Maryland for independence. Finally, on June 28, 1776, the Maryland Convention agreed to allow the Maryland delegates to the Second Continental Congress to actually vote for independence. So while Samuel Chase and Charles Carroll and others were busy rallying support for independence in Maryland, the delegates to the Continental Congress forged ahead and began the process of creating the Declaration of Independence. On June 11, 1776, the Continental Congress appointed a committee of five to begin actually drafting the Declaration of Independence document. This committee included the five following people, John Adams of Massachusetts, a future president, Benjamin Franklin of Philadelphia, we all know who Benjamin Franklin is. Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, also a future U.S. president. And then Robert Livingston of New York and Roger Sherman of Connecticut. After much discussion and deliberation, this committee selected Thomas Jefferson to actually be the author of the Declaration of Independence document. And so Thomas Jefferson, for the next several weeks, began meticulously working on that document and drafting our Declaration of Independence. So the Committee of Five finished that Declaration of Independence, um, again, authored by Thomas Jefferson, and presented it to the full Continental Congress at the end of June, 1776. Over the next couple of days, the Continental Congress made a number of different edits to the Jefferson draft. And the final deck document essentially goes as follows. The first part of the document explains why the people, like our colonists, had the right to ask for independence and then after that, the document lists the many, many, many grievances that the colonists had with the British government. The document concludes by declaring that the colonies should be free and independent of British rule. Basically, the colonists were committing treason. Pretty courageous act by them. Finally, on July 2nd, not July 4th, but on July 2nd, the Continental Congress voted for independence. Three Marylanders were pre present the, on July 2nd to actually vote for independence. Those three Marylanders were William Peca, Thomas Stone, and a gentleman by the name of John Rogers, who was a Prince George's County lawyer, but he's the only Marylander who voted for the Declaration of Independence, but wasn't able to sign it. So sometimes he's referred to as the lost signer. A few weeks later, on 
August 2nd, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was signed. Four Marylanders signed the Declaration of Independence. And let me show you right now what the Declaration of Independence looks like. And I'll show you how you can always find the four Marylanders who signed it. So this is our Declaration of Independence. Go way down to the bottom and we'll look for the big hand signature at the bottom by John Hancock. Right underneath John Hancock's signature are the four signers of the Declaration of Independence for Maryland. There's Samuel Chase, William Peca, Thomas Stone, and Charles Carroll of Carrollton on our Declaration of Independence. So I know I just went over those names kind of quickly, but if you want a tip from Squire Curtis, here's how you can always remember the four signers of the Declaration of Independence for Maryland. It's with a riddle. What's the riddle? My riddle goes like this. Why did Peca chase Carroll with a stone? Why did William Peca, Samuel Chase, Charles Carroll with a Thomas Stone? Why did Peca chase Carroll with a stone? The four signers of the Declaration of Independence from Maryland. Now, other thing that's really interesting about our four signers of the Declaration from Maryland is that all four of these folks had homes in Annapolis and all four of those homes exist today. Samuel Chase's house, Samuel Chase's house is called the Chase Lloyd House and it's located on Maryland Avenue and was built beginning in 1769. The William Peca House uh, was begun in 1763 and still exists today on Prince George's Street. Again, all these homes are in Annapolis. Thomas Stone moved into his house in Annapolis in 1783, and it was a pretty famous home because somebody else had already lived there um, before he did, and it was our friend Anthony Stewart. Yes, that same Anthony Stewart who shipped the Peggy Stewart was burned as part of the Annapolis Tea Party about 10 years before that. So the house that Thomas Stone lived in on Hanover Street is still referred to as the Peggy Stewart house, not the Thomas Stone house. Finally, Charles Carroll's house in Annapolis is, um, his basically was his childhood home. He was born there in 1737 and was born and raised there. That house exists along Spa Creek uh, on the Duke of Gloucester Street, right behind St. Mary's Church, uh, Catholic Church, which is perfect because Charles Carroll was the only Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence. So today, if you want to go see the Declaration of Independence, where would, where would you go? Well, you couldn't come here to Annapolis. You'd have to go to Washington, D.C. and go to the National Archives building. In the beautiful rotunda of the Charters of Freedom, you would see not only the U.S. Declaration of Independence, but also the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So in conclusion, I hope you enjoyed learning about the Declaration of Independence and the role that Maryland patriots played in approving and signing that document. Please come visit us here in Annapolis, and when you do, please be sure to check out the four houses of the four signers of the Declaration of Independence from Maryland. Thanks and have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.